Welcome to episode 162 of Eco Ask Why. Today, we have one of our very first listeners that's joining us to give us a breakdown of what a controls engineer really is. Chester Burke, he has been listening from the beginning, and he's exactly the type of guest that we want to bring on. He's an expert in his field, and he really hits on the need for controls engineers and how versatile that role really can be. We're still collecting industry war stories, the good, the tough, the inspiring. So send us those video clips or written entries as a DM on Instagram or Facebook. Check out the link in the show notes, and we look forward to hearing more of your stories. Without further ado, let's dive into our controls engineer discussion with our longtime listener and first-time guest, Chester Burke. Cue the music. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we're going to be talking about what is a controls engineer. Now throughout my career, I've been fortunate to call on a lot of controls engineers and, and get into plants and, and work side by side with these men and women. Had a blast doing it. So I'm excited to talk about this topic today and I brought in a, a great controls engineer. His name is Chester Burke and he is a controls engineer at Cadence Incorporated. So welcome Chester. How you doing? I'm good. How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And and I think our listeners would like to know. So you're you're a long time Eco SY fan, huh? Yes, I've been listening to your podcast. Uh I think I first learned about it from an email that Eco sent me and I picked up on your third episode. So I've listened to all of them. And I tell you what, you have a very good podcast. I listen to a lot of podcasts and you're very good at it. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. You're, you're the reason why we do it. And I'm excited for this episode because there may be people listening, Chester, that, that have no idea what a controls engineer is. You know, when they hear that topic, they may have an idea what an engineer is, but when you put the word controls in front of it, that, that muddies the water. So speak to that person who's new out there. How would you define what a control engineer actually is? Well, I can only speak from my perspective. Um, I automate production equipment. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer, so i my emphasis is on electrical. Uh, I pick out, uh, what motors we'll use, electric motors, uh, what variable frequency drives, uh, what PLC, what sensors, what wiring to connect everything up. I determine how to wire everything up. I do electrical drawings to show people how it should be wired up. I do any programming and anything needed electrically. Uh, program HMIs, what screens and operator sees, and so forth. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So, I mean, across the board with electrical focus, you know, you've been doing this for a while, Chester. I'm, I'm sure things <laughs> have evolved, you know, over time. So maybe walk us through what has been some of the, the, the biggest evolutions in the controls engineer world. Yeah, I'm afraid I've been at this since 1992. So you're still learning the ropes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That is one thing that uh, I can say about this career. Uh, you are forever learning. And I love to learn. I like to read. And that's been one of the things I really like. Uh, uh, things have changed since 1992. I think uh, I'd say things are easier to do today. Okay. than they were 30 years ago. Um, definitely, I've seen a lot of change when it comes to networking. Um, we started off with RS-485 networks like DeviceNet, Profibus, Modbus. Now it's evolved into Ethernet, mm -hmm. where we have protocols like Ethernet IP, Profinet, Modbus TCP. And um, Ethernet has evolved from an office type technology to um, industrial. We have industrial cables, connectors, but all these components are now connected together and they're all sharing data back and forth, like what they're doing, what's happening, what they should be doing. And it's evolved into the machine has become like an ethernet LAN, a local area network itself. Uh, and Nine times out of 10, you're going to be asked to connect this machine LAN up to your uh, uh, company network so information can be shared. And that opens up uh, another can of worms. Uh, you need to be uh, working well with your IT department because uh, 
they're from a world where you click on a button and okay, it takes a couple of seconds to, you know, the printer to spool up and start to work. We're in an industrial setting. Nah, this couple of seconds could sh shut a whole machine down. Mm -hmm. So there's concern with traffic and security and your IT department becomes your friend. No doubt. No doubt. You know, and I guess as, as more and more devices have gotten connected, Chester, and you hear, uh, industry 4.0 and, and you know digital transformation the way the, the way the world's moving towards you know connected devices how is that impacting like the modernization efforts how is the control engineer engaging there to really make that industrial 4.0 the things that people talk about actually come to life right yeah that's kind of up to your employer uh how far your company wants to take that mm -hmm. um you can uh, definitely get into some pretty high end stuff. Like say your IT department becomes your friend. You start talking about like populating databases with information like what uh, did we run today? How long did it take? What was the temperature in this section? And then that evolves into this stuff called data mining where you have a mountain of information and what really is important in this application. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've definitely come a long way since 1992. <laughs> now, the the listener out there, Chester, you know, we, we try to really inspire people to to take a look at industry and, and, and understand the different opportunities that exist. So sometimes it helps if, if I'm interested in something. Give me that inside look of what a day looks like, right? So maybe paint the picture. What, what would a typical day or a week or maybe even a month may be a better uh, – uh, a window of time look like for a controls engineer for someone in manufacturing because people may just not have an idea well i cannot say that i've ever had two days that were alike uh that means a lot I, right that means a lot i come to work with this uh, goals. I'm going to get this done this morning. I'm going to get this done this afternoon and it might happen. It might not. Uh, <laughs> What, uh, what I do, um, I do a lot, um, I guess, um, what might surprise your listeners or maybe not is I do a lot of communicating. Okay. I talk to a lot of people, uh, whether it's a plant manager, whether it's a department manager, whether it's a project engineer, whether it's my coworkers, whether it's an operator, maintenance, whatever. I do a lot of talking to people, I, I face to face emails, you know, software like this now that we're in this COVID situation. Um, so we do a lot of communicating, like uh, where are we at in the project? Um, are we on schedule? Has there been any problems? Um, what kind of um, things can we do to help this and that and lots of discussions? Um, sometimes, uh, our troubleshooters, in our case, our maintenance people, they'll come to me and say, hey, can you help us? Mm -hmm. We have a problem with this machine. So you you drop everything and you go to help them. Right. And while you're at it, you try to teach them, you know, what happened in the situation. And this is what we have to do differently. And hopefully they'll pass it on down to second and third shift. Right. Uh, when it comes to the actual work, um, well, in my particular position, uh, we start with a blank sheet of paper. We um, design our own in-house production machinery. So that means I have to choose everything, all the components, how they're wired up. Um, like I say, ordering stuff, uh, did it comes in, when will it get here? And I do a lot of organization, like from an outside contractor to our maintenance people, hey, this stuff is supposed to arrive here. Um, this is when we should be working on it. Are you able to show up? You know, how long how many days can you spend on this? And, right. and then while that's going on, you're answering tons of questions. No wired up this way. Yes. That's what I meant by this. When I put this on the prints, okay, I'll do it differently next time. Um, and then you actually get into the programming. You sit down and you program your PLCs, your HMIs, your drive. So, um, Somebody asked me one time, they said, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a conductor of a symphony of details. And I have to know if we do this, it's going to affect that. 
and somebody will say, um, well, well, can I use this component and see it? Well, maybe let's see how much current it draws. You know, did we, is the wire the right size and, yeah. and so forth. So that we just came up with a definite t-shirt for controls engineers, a conductor of a symphony <laughs> of details. So we, we, we're going to make that t-shirt. We got to get that made for you, Chester. I should have copyrighted it. You should have copyrighted it. It's too late. You know, we're, we're claiming it, but, uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, uh, one thing that stood out is, if I'm the listener and I'm thinking about a controls engineer, I may be thinking that I'm doing nothing but programming all day. And that is not what you said you do. I mean, that is a component. So you need to know how to program and do work with HMIs and PLCs and all that equipment. But the communication piece, I guess, really is what you emphasize the most in all the different areas that you have to coordinate with to ultimately make the controls work. Yeah, it's you're definitely part of a team. Uh, you're not the Lone Ranger. Yeah. And um, if you're going to be a good controls engineer, you take into account, in my opinion, you take into account other people's needs. Yeah. Um, if it's six one way, half a dozen another for you, and it means the world to someone else, mm -hmm. well, for me, it's only natural you do it that means the world for someone else. What about the, okay, let, let's keep going now on that, you know, so far as the new engineer, they're right out of college, for instance. They walked into their first manufacturing, you know, uh, experience. What what's the learning curve? What what what's in front of them that they need to know to be an effective controls engineer like yourself? Well, um, for me in particular, um, from my experience, um, I went to work for a carpet manufacturer in Glasgow, Virginia, Burlington Industries, and uh, it was a twenty four seven operation. Um. There are maintenance people um, definitely uh, took care of the machinery. And when they couldn't, I got the phone call, mm -hmm. um, no matter what time of day or night that phone call was. So uh, I learned very quickly if I wanted to sleep all night, I got to make my maintenance people's lives as easy as possible and give them the information they need to keep the machinery running. Um, learning curves. Um, I, the first of all, it was the vocabulary. It's like they told me, uh, we're having a problem with this inverter. And I'm going, okay, they taught me in school that an inverter was a piece of uh, electronic um, hardware, like a TTL device that changed the signal from one to zero. Okay. Well, no, 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 no. The inverter is that thing right there in the box that runs the motor. Right, the drive. And, and the drive. We call them drives, VFDs, and okay. And then they would tell me, you know, um, we're going to have to, you know, open up this pecker head on this motor and, and I'm going, what? <laughs> and that really is a legitimate yep. term. Yep. And, uh, so the vocabulary is you have to get used to what they call things. Um, I would say, um, I will uh, jump on it too with you, Chester and say when I'm in my motor days, the first time I, I, Somebody told me it was a pecker head. I thought I totally thought they were messing with me, man. I, I, I was, right. I was, I was, I'm like, you're, you're just joking with me. And they're like, no, it's really called pecker head. I'm like, okay, well, that's just too funny. Who came up with that, you know? <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a real term. Yep. Um, also, um, if you're smart as a new graduate, you will listen there to you the old gray haired people. And they, if they like you, they'll teach you a lot of stuff, uh, the stuff you really need to know to uh, do your job well. Mm -hmm. And really listen to them when they say, well, we used to do it this way and it worked or it didn't. Um, so, and also, so you have to learn how to get along with all kinds of uh, personalities mm -hmm. and, um, and so forth. So there's a lot of interpersonal skills. So it's not, it's not like um, someone who is just deep into uh, details and mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, you, you got you to have some personality and some personality skills. That's right. That's right. Now, you mentioned, you know, listening to the gray hairs and getting that advice. So are yeah, you, are, oh, yeah. are you, I hear you. I hear you. I, I'm getting there. So I think you know, mine's more to do with three, you know, three uh, kids and every, all that stuff going on. It's turning it gray, man. It's, and it's turning it gray fast. But you know, how about 
the mentors because you, you talked about you know getting with people and connecting with them so is that something if i'm a, a new controls engineer is that going to accelerate my path you think oh priceless priceless okay. um yes mentors um are priceless now be careful uh who you use as a mentor but um well, i had speak to that then what why would you why, why do you say that because a listener may be like oh what do you mean <laughs> I'm new to this. How do I, how do I pick right? Pick a good person who knows what they're talking about mm -hmm. and, um, isn't concerned with the politics, so to speak, mm -hmm. because these people will teach you what you need to know. Mm -hmm. And they also, you know, they could, can infect your attitude about your job Okay, and, um, just, be careful. But mm -hmm. when you get a good mentor, like the good Lord's blessed me with several good mentors, um, like at, like at Burlington, uh, I'm afraid to start mentioning people because I'll leave somebody out and I'll get mad. <laughs> but, um, Freddie Porterfield, uh, I consider him as one of uh, the most important mentors I've had. He, um, uh, took me under his wing. He told me, uh, what it really takes to keep a 24 seven operation working why we do this way and then that way and he kind of said Chester, you kind of might want to shut your mouth <laughs> and stuff like that right and uh, i learned yes i learned and i'm very grateful to freddie and he's retired now and living the good life out in west virginia there you go there you go it's funny you mentioned burlington you know i think when we were talking you know getting ready for for this episode my dad you know, worked at Burlington and Clarksville for a long time. And I remember those, he, he did much the same, some of the work that you did and those phone calls in the middle of the night. And he was always trying yes. to engineer out, uh, you know, and to make it, make it as simple as possible for the operators so that he wouldn't get those phone calls. So, uh, you know, ha, you know, hats off. And, and the, I remember the mentors that played in his life. And, and it sounds like you had the same type of, uh, people helping you along the way too. Yes. And I will, give credit where it's due the maintenance people at burlington industry mm -hmm. they did the best they could to keep from calling us in the middle of the night and i was so appreciative of that uh they wouldn't just call us for any old thing i mean right. if if that phone rang you knew it they had gone through several other people to get to you and it was really serious so That's i right. if they're if they're listening now thank you guys thank you there you go now how about the you know the engineer out there and they want to do more design work, you know, versus the troubleshooting piece component of it from a controls engineer standpoint. So is the controls engineer the right path for that individual if they want to take that design route? Well, designing, let's, let's, let's make sure we understand what we mean when we say design. Okay. Um, are you talking about designing, um, uh, like an e-stop relay, are you going to work for Rockwell? Are you going to work for, um, Siemens and to design their next VFD drive and so forth? Mm -hmm. Is, is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about, uh, we need to make the controls for this machine. Uh, do we pick Rockwell's e-stop relay or Siemens e-stop relay? Mm -hmm. Um, is which one are we talking about? I would say, let's go the second route because that's really what's going to be impacting. Cause if, if you go to design route with the manufacturer, that's a, that's a different path, right? Yes. So let's, let's talk about the path inside the, the plants themselves, the, the people that are making the product. All right. So, and like in my case, um, mm -hmm. uh, I have to admit, um, I thought my days at uh, Burlington where I was getting those phone calls and having to keep the machinery running were priceless. Um, it taught me real quick, um, about what it takes to make a good design. Mm -hmm. And I joke and, and say a good design engineer is someone who has spent some time trying to keep junk running. Right. Uh, when you, when you have to do that, you really learn quickly about why this cable doesn't work, why we should do this instead of that and why the keep it simple, stupid, um, way of doing things is so great now let it get complicated when it needs to be right don't get me wrong but when it could be done simply do it simply right so i would say for someone who wants uh, to be a design engineer like that 
um, it's, it wouldn't hurt to spend some time, uh, in a troubleshooting, um, role and then move on up into a modernization role yeah. where after yeah. you've kept this junk running, uh, you now figure out, Hey, it would be nice if we could put this on it and that on it. Wouldn't that yeah. make it such easier? And when you've done that, when you've really had to rebuild the race car while you're running at the race, um, and you can't have it down for so long, you, you must get it back up and running. Once you've spent some time doing that and then move on into the design work where you start with a blank sheet of paper. And like, I remember when I got called out of bed because, uh, I chose, or somebody chose to do it this way. Maybe I shouldn't do it that way. Right. And you, you start relying on your experience at that point. Um, and some people may not understand why you want to do things that way. Cause they never got the call at 2 AM and so forth. Right. That's right. There's so much that comes with that experience. And I am curious before we, we, you know, before we get to the end here, the types of equipment, you know, you already mentioned PLCs, HMIs, drives, what other types, you know, speak to the, again, the person who may be new to the industry, what other types of equipment are out there that, that you find yourself as a control engineer inter uh, interacting with? Um, okay. Um, like I say, PLCs, drives, HMIs, mm -hmm. and the networking that goes along with that, you, you'll run into, uh, breakers, okay. um, and auxiliary contacts off of breakers that single PLC that, you know, it's I'm tripped or I'm not, uh, safety, oh, a whole topic all to itself. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you'll, you'll get into learning about the categories based on this standard or that standard and how you have to wire things up to meet those uh, risk assessments. However, that's done in your particular company. Um, simple thing. Well, shouldn't say simple things like, uh, motor starters. Yeah. Um, get it. You can get into that, uh, DC power supplies. Uh, we like to use 24 volts DC as our, um, control, uh, voltages. We don't like, all right, you, you'll get into stuff like uh, arc flash. Um, oh, really? Okay. I didn't think you, controls engineers would get into, get into that. that space. Okay. <laughs> we, we open cabinets sometimes with 480. Yeah. In, you know, running drives and we have to know what personal protective equipment, PPEs, um, we should be wearing and deal with that. Right. That, that, get, that gets into what your, your design. Um, yeah. Do you want to try to design a cabinet so you don't have to open the door? Mm -hmm. that you may do your testing or viewing or whatever, uh, from the outside. So you don't have to deal with that. Right. That comes into play. Yeah. Uh, so it's a multitude of things. I mean, what kind of fuse holder do you want to use? Um, is this one easier for the, the maintenance guy to deal with than that one? Um, terminals. I mean, cabinet space is always at a premium. The cabinet's never big enough. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's as big as a house. It's never big enough, it seems. So you start talking about, you know, double and triple layer terminals. Are they joined and all that to try to, to take up less space? Right. And speaking of cabinet space, I mean, like we're talking about how things are changing. Uh, with networking and so forth, mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of these components moving out of the electrical cabinet and being mounted on the machine itself. And wow. the only thing going to them is a cable for power and another cable for Ethernet. So, so that's something new. Well, I mean, it's, I, as you were going through that list, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm racking my brain. I'm like, okay. I may have just freaked out a controls engineer who was thinking about it because how are they going to keep up with all these products and all these different solutions? So how do you learn about all this stuff? I mean, is it through distributors, vendors, uh, uh, GTG, go to Google? I mean, what, where is it at? How, how do you all do the above. It? Okay. You use any and all resources. Now, I um, rely heavily on my vendor salespeople. Okay. Um, they, um, I don't mind them sending me emails. I mean, in that's saying, Hey, we just released the newest whiz bang thing. And, uh, I'll look at the email and I'll glance over it. And if I got a need like, Hey, that could really work here. Mm -hmm. I'll contact them and say, send me more information. Yeah. If not, I'll glance it, file it in the back of my head for a future and hit the delete key. Um, I also try to subscribe to some, 
uh, magazines, whether print or digital, like control engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good way of getting an idea of what the, uh, the future holds. Mm -hmm. and, um, and like I say, Google, like if you need to do it and know how to do something, like how do you do something? Enter. Right. <laughs> and it'll yeah. spit back an answer and you dig through all the frivolous stuff and say, hey, and then follow that rabbit hole. And, find, and then find that YouTube video, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> YouTube videos do help. And a couple of your guests have got some good channels. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, just thinking right off the bat, Tim Wilburn, unbelievable channel he has. And we're trying to do more on the YouTube front ourselves just to answer those typical questions, the how to type questions that, you know, controls engineer may run into. So now how about, you know, Chester, we're getting, we're getting close to the end here. Speak to the engineer out there, or the, 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 the person in their career, and they want to start learning how to be a controls engineer. Where should they start investing their time and studying to get those skills? I don't think you got enough time. <laughs> Um, there is, um, lots of ways of getting from there to here. Okay. Um, maybe in another episode, we can talk about education. Um, but, um, try to get educated and it, I think it all boils down to what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want to be, um, the maintenance guy or so forth who troubleshoots? Do you want to be the design engineer? Um, and so forth. Um, I'd say you, you need an education. Yeah. Uh, that's a whole other subject there about whether you need a degree or not. Right. Um, but uh, you definitely need to get your foot in the door somewhere. Yeah. And once you do, uh, show initiative. Show that you want to learn. Right. Do things on your own. And you might look out with a company that will invest in you, send you to Rockwell, Siemens, Schneider schools or whatever they particular flavor they have. Right. And, um, it's, um, I like to say, I, I have to go into education and all, all, all sort of things. Well, that's, that was good advice there. And you even mentioned a few resources like the controls engineering magazine. That's a, that's been a great publication for years. I still get it. I still see it come across, uh, plant engineering. You know, there's, there's several of them out there and, and then LinkedIn groups and following I, people on YouTube, you know, that are in your space. That's a great way to learn. I would find someone who already does the work mm -hmm. and, um, pick their brain, ask them, how did you get here? What did right. you have to do? And, um, if you're already employed somewhere, you know, yep. be the guy who volunteers learn everything don't shy away from doing stuff and uh, you'll be surprised the opportunities that will open up for you it, they will they will well, Chester, this has been great teaching people about what a controls engineer is it's called eco ask why you know as a listener that we always wrap up with the why so why why are control engineers critical to that continued success of manufacturing in the future well if you're in manufacturing uh, you're making something. I don't care what it is, candy bars to diesel engines. Uh, you're making something and something is being made by a machine and that machine needs to run correctly and produce a quality product when it's needed at a rate that it's needed. Mm -hmm. uh, as a controls engineer and also of any from design to modernizing to troubleshooting all these people, um, they affect the bottom line. Um, so, um, it, it's a very nice field to be in and some very important field to be in for the health of your company. For sure. Well, Chester, this has been wonderful. You know, I know we got a lot of, uh, people that are excited now to go learn more about controls engineering. Thank you for, uh, you know, opening door or opening your doors and, and telling us about what you do and the, your typical day. And, uh, this has been a lot of fun unpacking control engineers. So thank you, sir. Well, thank you for having me. I, I'm honored. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by an electrical equipment company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. 
To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y dot com.